Super glue. So you've just been practicing your jujitsu moves and whoops, there goes the vase. Classic. When you need something that can fix your mess as fast as your roundhouse kick, super glue's got your back. But did you know that this substance was invented by accident? The inventor of super glue was a man named Dr. Harry Coover, who was trying to formulate a clear plastic for precision gun sights back in 1942 during the Second World War, but he instead found a chemical that stuck to everything. This chemical was cyanoacrylate. It was at first a real nuisance because they were incredibly sticky, bonding to anything they touched almost instantly due to the moisture in the air or on the materials being tested. This made them difficult to work with in the lab. A few years later, Coover's team eventually realized that they had something really valuable. They tried the cyanoacrylate monomers again, this time finding that they would bond without heat or pressure. Coover tried this glue on various objects in his lab, and each time, it immediately stuck the items together permanently. They sold the chemical under the name Eastman 910 in 1958, and it soon became a staple of every household, turning Coover into a TV star. Penicillin if it weren't for a fortunate lab accident, we might still be trying to fight bacterial infections with chicken soup and wishful thinking instead of the miracle that is penicillin. In 1928, Dr. Alexander Fleming returned from vacation to find mold growing on a petri dish of bacteria. Surprisingly, the mold stopped the bacteria from growing, leading him to discover penicillin. Fleming tried to purify it with the help of top chemicals, but they failed. Even after presenting his findings, his peers weren't interested and penicillin was dismissed as a lab curiosity. Eventually, Fleming gave up trying to refine it. Nearly a decade later in 1937, Howard Flowery and Ernst Chain rediscovered Fleming's work and gathered a team to focus on penicillin. Personality clashes and technical challenges slowed progress, but after years of trial and error, they finally produced pure penicillin. Despite initial success in animal trials, producing enough for human use was tough. So much so that they had to use bedpans and bathtubs for storage. They even recycled penicillin from patients' urine. With World War II raging, British industry couldn't handle mass production, so the team started seeking help from elsewhere. Flory then took penicillin to the U.S. in June 1941 to scale up production. In Peoria, Illinois, experts improved on it using deep fermentation tanks. Adding corn steep liqueur led to greatly increased yields. They also stumbled upon a supercharged strain of mold in a rotting cantaloupe. Microwave oven. Ever found yourself staring at last night's leftovers, wondering how to zap them back to life? Well, you need to thank Percy Spencer. If he hadn't been poking around with some weird lab discovery, you'd still be waiting for the oven to preheat. While working with a radar set in 1945, Percy accidentally discovered the microwave, and it was all because of a chocolate bar in his pocket. It got melted by the radar's magnetron tube. It got him wondering if microwaves could cook food. Spencer then tested it by taking corn and some eggs and placing them near the magnetron. The corn popped and the eggs cooked. The idea for the microwave was born. The magnetron tube itself was developed in England in 1940 for radar purposes during World War II, but it wasn't until 1946 that the first commercial microwave, the radar range, hit the market, though it was huge, expensive, and mostly used in restaurants and ships. The first residential microwave was made in 1955 by the company Tapan, though its size and $1,300 price tag kept it out of many homes. In 1967, Amana introduced a smaller, less expensive countertop model selling for about $500. Cheapened by the drop in the cost of components and the improvement of technology, microwaves became more common in the 1970s, and by the late 90s, nearly every American home had one. X-rays. Ever wondered how spotting a broken bone or something hidden inside your body is actually possible? It's all thanks to x-rays, a common everyday procedure now, but originally the result of one curious scientist's accidental discovery. As early as 1785, William Morgan, a British physician, observed glowing effects from electrical currents in a glass tube that had some of the properties of x-rays. He is also known as the first experimenter to have produced x-rays, but this he did unknowingly. In the late 19th century, cathode ray exploration was taken up by Stanford University scientist Fernando Sanford. He also detected x-rays and named his detection electric photography. 
In 1889, Ivan Puluhi, a lecturer in experimental physics at the Prague Polytechnic University, published a paper explaining how sealed photographic plates darkened when exposed to emissions from tubes filled with gas. However, it was the German professor of physics, Wilhelm Röntgen, who in 1985 officially identified the X-rays, giving this wonder its advertised name. On the 8th of November, 1895, Wilhelm Röntgen was working with Croke's tubes when he suddenly saw an invisible radiation pass through black cardboard, causing a fluorescent screen glow from afar. Then he realized that these rays could penetrate books and papers. Röntgen published his findings in December 1895, and he named his discovery X-rays to reflect their unknowable nature. For some time, everyone tried to name it after him, but the name Röntgen gave it stuck, and today we still know them as X-rays. For his discovery, Röntgen was awarded the first Nobel Peace Prize in Physics in 1901. Matchsticks From cavemen playing rock paper spark to the invention of the matchstick, starting a fire went from a workout to a one-swipe wonder. Let's dive into the story about how a matchstick came to be. Prior to matches, people had tricks to light fires, such as using a burning glass to concentrate sunlight, striking flint and steel together, or using a fire piston. Alchemists such as Henningbrand and others played with phosphorus, but it was impractical. By 1805, French chemist Jean Chancel invented a match that was risky and pricey, and it was refined a decade later by Samuel Jones in 1828 with the Promethean match, which contained a glass capsule that contained sulfuric acid and potassium chlorate and would ignite if crushed. Fast forward to 1826 when a chemist John Walker from Stockton-on-Tees in the United Kingdom accidentally discovered that a stick coated with chemicals would burst into flame when scraped against the floor of his fireplace. This happy accident led to the invention of the first friction match. Before Walker's breakthrough, making fire was a slow, tedious task. His friction light, which was first sold on the 12th of April 1827, made fire portable and easy. Walker had begun by using cardboard for his matches, but soon started to use hand-cut wooden splints and added a sandpaper striker to the box. A box of 50 matches cost one shilling. Walker was advised to patent his invention, but he didn't. Walker sold around 168 boxes between 1827 and 1829, but his matches were dangerous, causing fires and getting banned in France and Germany. In 1829, Sir Isaac Holden improved Walker's design, which eventually inspired Samuel Jones to commercialize it. By 1829, Samuel Jones copied it, and his own Lucifers were launched. Velcro It's that magical invention where two strips, one covered in tiny hooks, the other covered in soft loops, team up to hold your clothes together. Just slap them together and voila! Instant adhesion! But don't get too attached because when you peel them apart, you'll be treated to that unmistakable ripping sound. One day in 1941, the Swiss engineer George de Mestrel returned from a hunting trip and discovered that burdock burrs were stuck to his clothes and his dog. Peering at them through a microscope, he saw how these tiny hooks of the burrs snagged into the loops, which brought about the idea to create Velcro. By scaling down traditional hook and eye fasteners, Demestrel invented a two-dimensional surface where hooks and loops could connect without needing a perfect match. When George Demestrel first pitched his Velcro idea, industry people weren't impressed. His initial cotton prototypes didn't last, so he turned to nylon, which was new and promising. After eight years of tweaking, he perfected the process and patented it in 1955, but getting the world on board took time. The fabric's big break came when NASA used it in spacesuits. Soon after, skiers and fashion designers jumped in, giving Velcro its place in the spotlight. By the mid-60s, it was a hit with designers like Pierre Caudin. Despite cheap limitations flooding the market, Demestrel's patent expired in 1978. Velcro is now everywhere, and Demestrel was honored in the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Safety Glass Glass has a pretty wild history when you think about it. While natural glass like obsidian was used in the Stone Age, manufactured glass's origins are a bit bleak. Some say ancient Phoenicians in Syria discovered it when nitrum from their ship mixed with beach sand and melted into glass. Sometime after 3500 BC, glassmaking was being made in Egypt and Mesopotamia with Egyptians mastering it by 1500 BC. But 
the real groundbreaking discovery for glass came in the first century with the invention of glass blowing by Syrian craftsmen and thankfully, glass became affordable for everyone. Safety glass, which has been around since the early 20th century, is used where regular glass would be both dangerous and ineffective in the heat. You'll find it in car windows, public building windows, glass cookware, and even oven doors. Its invention was a happy accident by French scientist Edouard Benedictus in 1903. He dropped a flask containing cellulose nitrate and noticed it didn't shatter. This led to the development of safety glass. Austrian chemist Rudolf Seiden improved it with tempered glass, and John Crew used tree resin between glass layers. Benedictus's 1909 patent Triplex added polyvinyl butyrol for extra strength. Safety glass first proved its worth in World War I gas masks, and by the 1960s, regulations helped push its widespread use in vehicles and beyond. Pacemaker in the early 1900s, a researcher named Albert Hyman was studying the electrical activity of the heart when he accidentally pierced a dog's heart with an electrode and punctured it. Then, the heart started beating again when he took out the electrode. The idea of controlling heartbeats using electrical stimulation was born, however, it took many more experiments and accidents before the first pacemaker got implanted successfully in a human. In the 1950s, two doctors, Paul Zoll and William Cowenhoven, were both working at the same time to solve the same problem, regulating heartbeats. Zoll found that prolonged electrical shocks could make the heart beat regularly, leading to a device that could deliver these shocks. At the same time, Cowenhoven developed a mechanical device to compress the chest and stimulate the heart. The real breakthrough came in 1958 with Swedish engineer Rune Elmqvist's fully implantable pacemaker, a tiny, battery-powered device that transformed heart care. Around the same time as Rune Elmqvist, engineer Wilson Greatbatch was tinkering with a device to record heartbeats. When he accidentally used the wrong resistor, his oscillator started pulsing like a heartbeat. That gave him an idea. Why not use it to regulate heartbeats? Great Batch added a transistor and a battery, creating a small device that would mimic the rhythm of the heart. By 1960, he had tested it on a dog and on himself. He convinced Medtronic to produce it, and he received U.S. Food and Drug Administration's approval for the pacemaker in 1962. Today, it's a lifesaver and evidence of Great Batch's accidental brilliance. Teflon. When Roy J. Plunkett at DuPont tried to make a new kind of refrigerant in 1938, something unusual happened. The tetrafluoroethylene gas in his bottle stopped flowing before it should have been empty. Plunkett cut open the bottle out of curiosity and found a slippery, waxy material inside. He had just discovered polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE, a form of gas that was polymerized. PTFE was patented in 1941, and it led to the creation of Teflon. PTFE is one of the most incredible materials ever discovered. It is super slippery and resists almost every chemical, which has made it the go-to substance for a number of industries, from aerospace and electronics to architecture. Since Teflon was trademarked in 1945, it has become known with non-stick surfaces from cookware to stain-resistant fabrics. The first Teflon products hit the market in 1946. The invention of PTFE is often called a mix of luck, genius, and a happy accident. Whatever you call it, it changed the plastics world and opened up countless possibilities. Ultimately, Plunkett's discovery landed him into the Plastics Hall of Fame in 1973 and, in 1985, into the National Inventors Hall of Fame, along with other gigantic minds such as Edison and Pasteur. The Camus Plunkett Awards recognizes the innovator by celebrating innovation in his name. Thank you.